The science of mindfulness and meditation has attracted a lot of attention in the past couple of decades. By now, thousands of research studies have been published on the subject. So in this video, we'll take a look at what the research seems to be pointing toward. And I'll also be sharing some reflections on the limitations of science in the context of meditation, as well as gather some resources and links for further exploration. But first, a word of caution that I want to be careful when claiming scientific evidence of the benefits of meditation. So first of all, many of the studies that have been done are, are quite small and the research field as a whole is still young. So that's important to keep in mind. And even when uh, referring to scientifically validated results, those results have been found under certain circumstances, often using mindfulness-based interventions of eight-week programs under certain conditions with experienced teachers and so on. So we need to be very careful when claiming or translating those benefits and, and kind of claiming equivalence, you know, so it's, we can't assume that any type of meditation under any circumstances will yield the same results. And I personally think it can be harmful to the meditation or mindfulness field uh, to exaggerate the scientific evidence or to present it out of context. And the Mindfulness Initiative, I think, said it very well in their field book for mindfulness innovators. Let us be clear. At no point will we claim that mindfulness alone will solve the world's problems, nor will it render limitless our free will irrespective of the social structures that constrain and condition us. Mindfulness training is not a silver bullet, but rather an activator of important capacities within the wider ecosystem of intentional action. These capacities are innate, available, and already part of human experience. One way to get a broad overview of the research findings is to look at meta-analyses. And these are systematic reviews that summarize results from several different studies using statistical methods. And these studies generally show that standard mindfulness-based interventions, normally eight-week programs and so on, have consistent and reliable effects on psychological and physical measures of health and well-being in both adults and young people. So let's have a closer look at what's happening in the brain as we're meditating. This is the field of neuroscience and before we dig in it'll be helpful to understand the concept of neuroplasticity. The fact that our, that our brains are, are plastic, that they're constantly changing and reshaping themselves. So specifically, the neural circuits in the brain get strengthened based on how we use our minds and attention. So in other words, we get good at what we practice. If we practice, for example, mind wandering and scattered attention, the neural pathways will, will start supporting that way of being. So we will basically, even the physical brains will start optimizing for this. And we now know that mindfulness and meditation literally changes the structure of the brain in favor of concentration and the ability to pay attention to what's happening in the present moment. Well-known studies carried out by Sarah Lazar and her team, for example, they demonstrated that eight weeks of daily meditation practice literally changed the brain structures of the participants in the study. And they were able to demonstrate benefits such as decreased levels of stress, which was correlated with decreased gray matter in the amygdala, this is the part of our brains that can be seen as sort of like a threat radar. It keeps an eye out for anything in our environment that, that seems threatening and it triggers emotions like anger and fear. And so it seems like meditation practice in a way makes that radar less paranoid and we are less uh, likely to experience our surrounding as threatening, enabling the autonom autonomic nervous system to come back into balance. And, and this reduces the stress levels overall. And this, I think, explains the success of mindfulness-based interventions that focus on stress reduction, such as MBSR. And this alone can be a life changer and even life saver for many people. And so can reduce symptoms of depression, anxiety disorder, pain and insomnia. Brain scans showed that the insula got bigger. And this is the part of the brain that uh, receives uh, signals from the subcortical region and it assists in emotional regulation. It's also the part of the brain that connects the two hemispheres, so it suggests that it actually helps integrate the two ways of being 
that uh, the left and the right hemisphere represent. Another part of the brain that was strengthened was the left hippocampus, which is associated with memory and learning, and less gray matter in this region is associated with depression and heightened symptoms of PTSD, for example. And one study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association done on war veterans using control groups, they found that mindfulness interventions were actually more effective than standard treatments in battling the symptoms of PTSD and had a larger effect on overall quality of life. I don't feel like I'm treading water anymore and I feel mindfulness has brought me back to who I am and who my family can enjoy again. I wish I would have had the opportunity when I was a young man to have been able to have this resource. I would have been a completely different person today. I feel peace and that has been a situation which has escaped me in the 40 years since I was last in combat. So increased overall quality of life, enhanced ability to pay attention, improved immune function, and the study also suggests that meditation can help prevent cognitive deterioration that happens with age. And this has to do with the frontal lobe, the neocortex, the more evolved parts of our brain evolutionarily, which is involved in decision making and working memory and cognition overall and this part of the brain tends to deteriorate as we as we as we get older but what they found in meditators was that the gray matter was preserved over time and finally they demonstrated increased capacity for empathy and perspective taking and we talked about the insula before this region that got thicker through meditation and is not responsible solely for emotional regulation but it's also correlated with increased capacity for empathy for other people. And empathy also has to do with perspective taking, which is associated with the temporal parietal junction. And meditation increases the gray matter in this region, enhancing the ability for us to take the perspective of others. And these findings all get very clear when they look into experienced meditators, these long-term athlete level meditators where they can actually literally see changes, long-term changes in the brain activity. So most of us live in what's called beta activity in the brain. These are brain waves that are very fast and they're correlated with uh, thinking and problem solving and threat detection, normal waking consciousness. But when we fall into concentration, when we feel relaxed and yet alert at the same time, such as moments of mindfulness, or when we fall into flow states, the brain actually slows down and falls into alpha activity. And this state is also correlated with decreased uh, negative moods and emotions and anger. Um, and what they saw in long-term meditators was consistently higher uh, alpha activity in the brain, as well as more pronounced regions of the brain correlated with empathy, as we talked about. In some of these studies, researchers found another type of brain activity altogether, which is called gamma activity. So in one study, for example, with Tibetan meditation master Mingyur Rinpoche, they found consistent levels of gamma activity lasting for the entire duration of meditation sittings. And when the researchers found this out, they thought there was some error in the measurements because most brains don't emit this type of activity for more than fractions of a second at a time. So this is Dr. Richard Davidson. Uh, when we discovered that it was real, it was really quite amazing because nobody had ever seen these kinds of signals before. So that was really uh, a very important moment because we knew from that from a scientific perspective, there was a there there. So what is that there that is there? So this brain state is sometimes called super consciousness. And what's happening from an outside perspective is that the brain starts secreting very profound neurotransmitters in the pineal gland uh, with structures very similar to dimethyltryptamine, which is the most powerful mind altering substance known to man, DMT. And from an inside perspective, what tends to happen is that this triggers profound experiences, experiences that are reported as being more real than anything experienced in the outer world. 
These are often very life-changing and healing uh, experiences. And Dr. Joe Dispenza describes this as the body moving out of the past. They've reported unexplainable occurrences of healing that happens instantly when this occurs. And I think this is where we approach the edge of scientific understanding. So I believe we still have a lot to learn in terms of the benefits of meditation. And I believe that science has a very important part to play in this, namely the outer aspect, that which can be observed from the outside and that can be measured. So we can measure hormones, neurotransmitters, stress levels, we can do social studies, we can start mapping out correlations between meditation, inner work, and outer measurements. And I think that this can pl play an important role in opening up the eyes and opening up the interest for inner work, which is greatly needed in th today's world. And perhaps it can even help make these benefits more accessible and scalable as well. But important as it is, I think we need to remember that the science does not make the benefits of meditation real. It merely demonstrates and validates what often has been known in many traditions for thousands of years. So science points to the tremendous power of what we might call inner work, but it does not give us access to that power. For that we have to do the work for ourselves, we have to do the science. The science of observing for ourselves and finding out what is true. Finding out what is true beyond concepts, even concepts of inner and outer. Finding out what is true beyond uh, any belief systems, even beliefs in scientific findings. So we all have to build our own instrument and we also have to cultivate and learn wise ways of using it. Thank you.